Hello, I'd like to thank you once again for tuning in to this week's message. If you'd like more information about Journey Church, its various ministries, be sure to check us out at journeychurch.org or find us on Facebook where you can get additional resources to help you just grow in your walk of faith. We hope to see you sometime. If you're ever in the Jacksonville area, come on in and say hello. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye. Good morning, everybody. Everybody good? Awesome. Well, this morning, I have the opportunity to bring the Word of God. How awesome is that? If you don't know me, my name is Adam. I'm the worship pastor here. And um, so this is my first time getting to share here, which is, which is incredible. Last week, uh, Pastor Eric brought a great word on the rescue. Uh, this morning, um, they gave me the topic, the last one, um, on judgment. Thank you very much, right? <laughs> so um, it's a little bit of a heavy subject, but it's, it's kind of not what you, what you probably think either. Um, but I just want to pray this morning that you sense the love of God in this room, that you sense the grace of God in this room in the midst of the topic we're talking about. Um, and I just believe that if we really take in what God has for us this morning, that we're going to have a different perspective on life. We're going to see things differently. And we're going to move towards the goal of um, seeing God's kingdom here on earth. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. God, we, um, we are just so thankful that we are here gathered together today. And that, God, your love and your grace is in this room right now, Jesus. And, Lord, I just pray that, that today, God, that you would speak to our hearts. God, speak through me, Jesus. I, I just surrender right now to you, God. And ask for you just to use me, Father. And God, we, um, we're just so thankful, God, that we're here. Lord, speak to us. Guide us. Lead us this morning by your Holy Spirit. Everyone said amen. 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 I want to start off with a, uh, a quote from C.S. Lewis from the book Mere Christianity. It says this. If you read history, you will find the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. You have to understand that perspective is really an important thing. That our perspective on eternity is going to cause us to value certain things or not value certain things. If we have a healthy perspective on eternity, we're going to do certain things we may not necessarily do. We're going to set some goals in our life that we wouldn't probably set if we didn't have a perspective of eternity. This morning, if I were to come and roll out a table full of desserts, I mean, on this table there is chocolate cake, there is carrot cake, there is pineapple upside down cake, which is one of my new favorites. There is cobbler with vanilla ice cream. Y'all, I'm from South Carolina. We like our cobbler with vanilla ice cream. And on this table, I said, okay, so you have one day with this glorious table of desserts. What would you do? Man, I'm going to try to eat every single one on that table, am I not? Like, I'm going to take a bite of this one, a bite of that one. I might finish one off, probably the cobbler vanilla ice cream, you know. Like, I'm going to do, I'm going to eat as much as I possibly can. But if I told you, okay, you have three months with this glorious table of desserts, what would you do? Well, you might eat one. You might take a break the next day, you know. You might eat another one the third day. Save a little bit. Wait till you're going to pace yourself, right? Why? Because you don't want to get sick. You don't want to gain 10 pounds. You don't want to compromise your health, do you? You see, perspective is a powerful thing. Do you get what I'm saying this morning? So for this reason, John the Apostle, when he was in his 90s, his 90s, so he's a pretty old, old dude, right? He says this in John 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we've worked for. That's a powerful statement coming from this man. He said, but that we receive a full reward. Everyone say full reward. How many believe that God is a rewarder? Amen? He rewards us. 
I mean, how does he introduce himself to Abraham? He appears and he says, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. Notice this, John doesn't just say reward, he says what? Full reward. That means there is a partial reward scenario, there is a no reward scenario, and there is a full reward scenario. Now, isn't it interesting, though, that John doesn't write and say, hey, live in such a way that you receive a partial reward? Why doesn't he write that? Because God wants you to receive a full reward. You know, as a father, I love giving gifts to my kids. I love seeing the joy on their faces. I mean, Christmas time is so much fun around my house. I have a, I have a four-year-old. His name is Caleb. I have a six-year-old, um, and her name is Ruth. My four-year-old's about to turn five, and so they're like right at that prime age, right, for giving gifts and giving presents. And there is nothing better than giving a present to a child and seeing the joy on their face, especially when it's your own kid. Um, but in this society today, what do we do? Like, if you participate in a sport, what do you get? You get a trophy. Like, I mean, come on. Like, if you didn't deserve it, you just participated, you get a trophy, right? I think this has somehow ruined our perspective on reward system, hasn't it? Like, I've created a lot with my wife, like, hey, if, if my son, he's playing soccer, and his team gets last place, and they still give him a trophy for getting it, I mean... When he gets home, I'm probably going to take that trophy from him, guys. <laughs> like, honestly, I feel like it's unhealthy for people to get a trophy when they didn't deserve it. It ruins incentive, and incentive is a powerful thing. Incentive is a good thing. And Paul says basically the same thing. Paul says towards the end of his life in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, run your race in such a way that you get a prize, the prize. The prize being what? The full reward. Run your waist in such a way that you get the prize. So why do these men write this with such passion? Because they know something that a lot of Christians in this world don't know and understand. You see, every one of us is going to stand before Jesus Christ as judge. Every one of us is going to stand before Jesus Christ as judge. You say, whoa, Adam, wait a minute. I mean, come on, Jesus, he's my savior. He saved me. I've prayed the prayer. Like, I am saved. I'm not going to be judged, right? That's what we think. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says this in verse 8. We are confident, yes, very well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now we know right there that Paul isn't talking to all humanity. How do we know that? Because when an unbeliever is absent from the body, they're not in the presence of the Lord. Where are they at? They're in hell. And this is not a harsh statement or, or a mean statement. This is a statement of fact. Remember Jesus said, I came into the world to save it, not condemn it. He came to save us out of what we condemned ourselves to. So we know right here in verse 8 that Paul is only talking to believers here because unbelievers, when they are absent from the body, where are they at? They're in hell. So we see in verse 9, therefore we make it our aim, our aim or our goal, whether present or absent, to be very well pleasing. Very well pleasing. About three weeks ago, um, I hear a scream in the other room. And of course, having a four and six-year-old, who is it? It's, it's, my, it's my daughter screaming. Why? Because my son, Caleb, he decides to hit my daughter, Ruth, because they are fighting over the TV changer and what to watch on Netflix. And so I walk in there, I'm like, hey, guys, what in the world is going on right now? What are y'all doing? Why is Ruth crying? And Ruth kind of in a crying voice, she says, Caleb hit me. And so sure enough, I look at his face. It's the truth. He definitely <laughs> hit my daughter, Ruth. And so I'll go over to him, I pick him up off the ground, I give him three spankings, because how many of you guys know that the rod will drive them far from it? Like, it is good. Like, spank your kids, it is, it's a good thing up to a certain age, you know? Figure out the age, not, not until they're 18 or 19, that's a little too much probably. <laughs> so I spank him, I put him over in timeout for three, four minutes, whatever it might be, and I call him over to myself and I say, hey Caleb, I wanna talk to you, buddy. And I say to him, son, 
There is nothing you can ever do to cause me to love you any more than what I love you. There's also nothing you can do to cause me to love you any less than what I love you, buddy. But, son, you are in charge of how proud I am of you and how disappointed I am with you. And right now, buddy, I'm disappointed with you. I'm disappointed in the decision you made to hit your sister. I'm disappointed in the way you've been acting today. He hadn't been listening to his mom all day. And, you know, he needed that spanking to kind of straighten him out a little bit. I said, buddy, I'm disappointed in you, but I love you, son. I give him a hug and I give him a kiss. And I say, son, God's got great things for your life. And I just kind of use those moments when, after I spank him to speak into his life. I say, son, God's got great things for your life. And I'm doing this out of love because I want what's best for you. I want to see you walk in the calling that God has in your life. And I don't want to see you stray from it, buddy. He may not understand all what I'm saying, but he gets it. He will get it one day, right? You see, my point is, you can't do one thing to make God love you any more than he already loves you. And you can't do one thing to make him love you any less than what he does love you. He loves you the same. But, on the same token, we are in charge of how pleased God is with us. And that's why Paul said, we make it our goal, not just to be pleasing, but what? Well, pleasing. Why? Because next verse, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the, the things done in the body according to what has, been, has done, whether good or bad. You see, every one of us as believers are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And at that judgment seat, we're going to be examined not for our sin. Why? As believers, our sin has been eradicated. Our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. And so we're not going to be judged by our morals, but we're going to be judged by what we do, what we have done. Everybody say, thank God for the grace of God. As we confess with our mouth, our sin has been eradicated, our sins are gone. We, but we will stand before Jesus, and he will give an account of how we live this life as Christians. And the Bible is very clear that he will not only examine our works as Christians, but he will examine our words as well as our thoughts and our motives and our intentions. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says this. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of the time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest to light and he will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. You see, when a sinner stands at the white throne judgment, there will be no praise given. Paul is not talking about sinners. He's talking about believers right here. Now, whenever you say the word judgment in today's world, what do we immediately go to? We go to condemnation, right? We immediately go to the word condemnation. However, 90% of the time that we see this word judgment appear in the New Testament is from the Greek word krema. Krema is spelled C-R-E-M-A. And what this means is a decision resulting from an investigation. A decision resulting from an investigation. That's simply what judgment means. It means decision. So Jesus is going to examine our lives as Christians He's going to examine our works, our words, our thoughts, our motives, our intentions. And as a result of that thorough investigation, he's going to make decisions over our life. Because remember, judgment means decisions. As a result of those decisions, we're either going to receive rewards or we're going to suffer great loss. And the Bible is, is, is pretty clear that the rewards that we receive to the losses we can suffer are anywhere from reigning besides Christ forever and ever, all the way to having everything we've done here on earth just burnt up and gone away. That's a vast range. The former would be the full reward. The latter would be no reward, and everything in between would be some kind of partial reward. Hebrews 6 tells us, the judgment that he makes over our lives at that judgment seat are called eternal judgments or decisions. 
There are eternal decisions that are going to stand for eternity forever and forever and ever. So you know what that tells me. Listen to this statement. What we do with the cross determines where we're going, where we're going to spend eternity. However, the way we live as believers determines how we are going to spend eternity. Let me say that again. What we do with the cross, whether we accept Jesus in in our heart or, or not, determines where we are going to spend eternity, heaven or hell. However, the way we live as believers determines how we are going to spend eternity. Now, James, in his little book, in the fourth chapter, the 14th verse, he makes this amazing statement, and he says, this life is but a vapor. Basically saying this life is zero time. And simple mathematics tells us that any finite number divided by infinity equals zero. So say you live to to 80 years old. You divide 80 by infinity, what do you get? You get zero, okay? Say you live to 146, which is actually the oldest man on the earth right now. He's 146 years old. He lives in some country in Asia. I mean, once I reach 100 years old, God, please take me. I mean, come on, Jesus. I'm ready to go home. I am done with my work here on earth. Take me, Jesus. 146. But if you live to 146 like this fortunate man, you divide that by infinity, what do you get? You get zero. You see, what we do in this zero time determines how we are going to spend eternity. Let me go a little, a little further. Say there is a person who comes in this room, and uh, it's a leader, and they say to you, okay, the way you spend this next day of your life is going to determine how you live the next thousand years. A thousand years ago, think about a thousand years for a second. A thousand years ago, America did not even exist, Right? King Louis XIV was king of France. I looked it up. <laughs> right? There's no air conditioning, so what, what's happening? We're probably not living in Florida, are we? I mean, I need air conditioning in my life. I don't see how people did it before the 1940s or whenever, whenever AC came. Like that, man. And this weather, I mean, it's like 100 degrees this past week. Ridiculous. We would not be living in Florida. A, a thousand years ago, This one day dictates the next thousand years of your life. Let's take another step further. Say a million years. The next day determines the next million years of his life. When we go back 6,000 years, we have Adam and Eve. But this number is still a finite number. It can still be calculated. But what we do and how we live is going to determine how we spend eternity. So if I was to say this next day that you live determines the next thousand years, the next million years. Would you live it with purpose? Would you live it with purpose or would you throw this next day just a chance? Would you be like, well, whatever. What would you do? You'd live with a purpose, right? you live with a purpose. You see what we do in this zero time. This vapor time determines how we are going to spend eternity forever and ever and ever. You see, when God speaks about our life in terms of eternity, many times in Scripture, he speaks to us about being builders. Example, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain, right? The stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. When studying this, I noticed that there are two areas that we as believers are going to be judged on by Jesus or examined on. Our involvement in building the kingdom of God. Notice the word building. And two, how we built individual lives or our influence over people. Let's go to Corinthians to talk about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. It says this. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Verse 12, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. You see, the gold, silver, and jewels is eternal things. The wood, hay, and straw is temporal things. 
In every moment of our lives, we have a choice. We have a decision to make. And you have to understand God gives us these choices to make. You can build however you want. For example, this morning, you, you have a chance when, you, when you're on social media to build on the eternal, to encourage people, to, to share the gospel. And this is a great avenue to do it. That's why we ask people to share um, at the very beginning of service. Hey, get online, share uh, the service this morning. We want to get the gospel out. That's our purpose for doing that. It's, it's an avenue. It's a way of sharing the gospel. Or we can spend social media and just make it temporal. Probably a better example this morning. Say there's a person on the worship team and they simply just want to be up there to get praise, just to be seen, right? Guys, we have a great worship team. I'm telling you, I might be the leader of it, but uh, we do have a great worship team. They have a great hearts. They're talented musicians and we are just extremely blessed. But say there's some person up here who just wants to simply receive, hey, you're awesome, you seem great, you know, that pat on the back kind of thing. Or there's another person up here who just simply wants to lift up worship to Jesus, simply just wants to make him famous, simply just wants to lead others into the presence of God. What is that? That's not temporal, but it's eternal, right? You see, every motive Every motive, every thought is going to be examined. Verse 13, but on the judgment day, fire, everybody say fire. Fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if the person's work is of any value. So you put the fire under the person wanting to, see, wanting to receive glorification of self, gone, burnt up. But when you put the fire on the person who is just worshiping Jesus, who wants to make him famous, or the person who is serving at Journey Out, or the person uh, who is serving at Mo Journey, or the person who is um, helping the homeless out, who is feeding the hungry, who is clothing the naked, what is that? That is eternity, building for eternity. You see, what, what is the standard? What is the fire that will be judged on judgment day. His word is the fire. Jeremiah said his word is like a fire. That's why I'm amazed how many Christians I know don't spend any time in the word of God. The word of God discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And that's the only thing you can think. You have great motive, but the word of God will expose your motives. Look what Jesus says in John. Jesus says, the word I speak, I have spoken, will judge him in that last day. Verse 14, if the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. Hopefully what? A full reward, right? Next verse, but if the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved. In other words, the builder will go to heaven. But like someone barely escaping through walls of flames. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just barely escape and get to heaven. I want to receive a reward. Uh, when we, um, as Americans, we do something really smart, we, um, we save for retirement, right? So we spend hopefully 30 years saving for retirement for after 65, 60 years old. And we work our way up to this. But suppose on the day that you retire, the bank that you bank at goes bankrupt. Man, it is raining good, is it not? I can't ignore that. It is coming down hard. Hopefully your windows are up. Supposedly, retirement, bank closes down, right? All your money is gone. On that same day, there comes a thunder. On that same day that this happens, your insurance company goes bankrupt as well. On that same day, um, Social Security is gone. The treasury has no more money to give to anybody anymore. It's gone. On that same day, you lose everything. You lose your house. You're only there with your pajamas now. It's burnt up. You lose everything. You see, most Americans can't relate to that because the bank, what? They, they bail out. The government bails out the bank if they go bankrupt, right? We live in that society right now. 
But say this happens, and this is the language that Paul is using to describe how many Christians are going to enter into eternity. Not 30 years of retirement, we're talking about eternity here. And this is why Paul says with passion, so run your race so that you may lay hold of the prize. Run your race so you may lay hold of the prize. John 17, 4, Jesus said, I have finished the work which I have given you to do. I'm sorry, Jesus said, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. That doesn't surprise me or you. Jesus said, has specific task. He has a specific goal. We say to ourselves, I don't really, but I know Jesus did. And that's not true. You have a purpose. God has given you a purpose. God has given you a plan. People also think Jesus was born knowing the will of God. No, Jesus had to seek the will of God. Like you and I, he said, I seek the will of him who sent me. Paul said, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have finished my race. If you run cross country, you have to know the direction you're running. They give you a map before you run cross country and say, hey, this is, this is where you're supposed to go, this is the finish line, this is where you're supposed to go. Without that map though, what's gonna happen? You're gonna run, you're gonna run, you're gonna run, you're gonna run until you're tired and you collapse and then they bring you home, right? You have to know the direction that you're going in order to finish your race and that's what Paul's saying. He got the direction he's supposed to go, he finished his race. The only way you can say that is if you know your course. Ephesians 2.8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift, everybody say gift, it is the gift of God, not of works. So let me just make something really clear this morning. I don't want you to think differently. We cannot be saved by anything that we do. We have been saved by grace and grace alone. And this is a free gift given for everyone to receive, whether or not you receive that free gift or not. We cannot do anything to get to heaven. But if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, right, we will be saved. Verse 10 says this, though. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should... Walk in them. Psalms 139 says this. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. So every moment was laid out in that book before a single day passed. God said to Jeremiah, you have set, I have set you apart and I have appointed you. Paul said, it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Here's the disconnect. People think like Paul, Mother Teresa, King David, you know, Jesus, they had a calling on their life. You know what? I'm just a person here existing. I just am. I don't really have a calling. I'm just, I just want to get to heaven. No, God has a calling and a purpose, and a plan that he has called you to. That he has called you to. Every single person has a calling on their life. It's a calling that God wrote in a book. In Daniel it says, at the judgment, the books will be opened. What he's going to do is he's going to open his book he wrote about your life and he's going to say, let's compare. Let's compare. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says this. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it. God does it so that people will fear him. What he is saying is my house is going to be finished. My house is going to be full, whether you cooperate or not. I will find someone to finish the work and to finish my house. You see, God is building a house and it's called Zion. And it's going to be finished whether we help or not. And that's sovereignty right there. That's the sovereign work of God. But next verse, this speaks of free will. Verse 15, whatever is has already been. Where was it? 
is recorded in the book before any of us. And what will be has been before. Next statement. And God will call the past to account. In other words, did you walk in what God recorded in that book or did you go your own way? Did you walk in the calling that God has called you to or did you go your own way? So what does this tell me? Jesus said many are called but few are chosen. What Jesus meant is few pay the price to seek God diligently, to seek his face, to be in prayer, to be in the word. And it's a serious call for this very serious time. You see, the majority of Christians, supposedly, they're saved from eternal damnation by the gospel are now sitting back and making excuses for not sharing the gospel which saved their very life. And the very reason we have been saved is for the global mission. And anything less than passionate involvement in building God's kingdom is selling God short and frustrating the very purpose for which you exist. And I challenge you this morning, share the gospel. I challenge you this morning, live the gospel. If you are a Christian and you're frustrated with your life, it might be because you have been, become distracted with the very reason you were alive. To share the gospel, to live the gospel, to bring God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven right now, today. You know, I don't care if you're seven years old and you're in here. I don't care if you're 70 God has a plan and a purpose for every single purpose, person's life. And we need to be people who wake up every day and seek the face of Jesus so we can get direction every single day. If we're not seeking him every single day, how do we know the direction and the path that God's called us to? How do we know where to go? How do we know what to do? Who knows, God might be calling you that morning to have an encounter with somebody. Are you prayed up? Are you ready to have that encounter, to lead them to the Lord? Are you ready every single day? Because if you're not giving for the Lord to know your direction, to know your calling every single day, or your calling overall for that matter, then what are you doing? Are you living the gospel? Guys, I'm gonna be the first one to say, I don't do this well enough. This message is so challenging me for me as, I'm stu as I was studying this this past few weeks and going through these notes, I'm like, man, God, this, this is hard. This is really difficult. And that's why I believe it's so important for believers to gather together, that we meet together on Sundays and we fellowship with one another. We encourage one, one another to live this gospel out and to do it well, not to sit on the sideline, not just to do. I mean, God is going to judge our motives, our motives, our intentions. God, help us. I'll, when I get to heaven, I want to have something that I've built. I want to hear those words, good job, you faithful servant. I want to hear that. I don't want to just be barely getting into heaven. God has so much more for us than that. Amen? He has so much more for us than that. I mean, if Jesus, <laughs> the son of the living God, if Jesus had to seek the will of God to get direction, how much more should we? How much more should we? Let's pray right now with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask you this morning, if you say to yourself, you know, I have not been seeking God diligently like I should. And I want God's direction and his purpose for my life. I want to walk in that. Would you raise your hand right now? I'm raising my hand right now, guys. I want God's will for my life. All over this room, come on. If that is you, raise your hand right now. If you feel like you can do a better job. I can do a better job, guys. I can do a better job. Amen. I want to pray for us right now. Jesus, I just thank you for this group, God that raised their hand and said, 
We want to seek you diligently. And we want your will. We want your way, God. God, we want moments to where we can share the gospel. God, I pray for every person in this room that, God, you would give us moments. And, God, you would give us opportunities to share your gospel, Jesus. God, put those in front of us. And God, may we be obedient in that. We are builders building your kingdom and you have called us to a a purpose every single day of our life. We are not just running this rat race getting by, but you have called us and you have purposed us for your will, for your kingdom, Jesus. And God, we want to walk in that. So I pray for grace to help us to live that out. Help us to seek your face diligently, Jesus. That we would be challenged by that. One more question. If you were in this room right now and you say, you know, I've never given my heart to the Lord before. I've never had that moment where I've just said, Jesus, come to my life and take over. I want to live this life for you. Would you raise your hand right now? Is there anyone in this room right now who would say that? Sounds like God is calling you with thunder. Is there anyone else in this room, anyone in this room right now who's not right with the Lord? Nobody? So we're all right. We're all ready. We're all ready to run this race then. We're all ready to see the gospel transform this city for the glory of God. Amen? Let me pray us out. Jesus, I just thank you so much for your word that guides our motives, that guides our intentions, God. I just pray for each and every one of us in this room right now that, Lord, that we would be disciplined in our time with you, Jesus. That, God, we would be builders for your kingdom. God, one day we are going to stand before you and you're going to judge us, God, for what we've done and what we haven't. God, you have a great purpose. And I pray for every person. God, may we walk in the purpose, in the way that you have for us, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Yes, give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Guys, God is so incredibly good, and he has a purpose for your life. I challenge you walk in that this week. Seek his face this week. And I pray that you have encounters with people this week so you were able to share the love of Jesus. Amen. Have a great week. Love you guys.